Well, I'm ready to bring the word to you today. If you have your Bibles, open your Bibles to John chapter 10. Uh, we're going to read a lot of scripture today. Is that cool? Does that offend you? Like, did you come to church and like, man, the pastor's reading the Bible? Like, I'm offended. Because you know how the world is now. You just get offended by, you know, everything. So um, I don't really care if I offend you by the word of God this morning. I'm just going to preach it how I feel like God gave it to me. Is that cool? Amen. We're starting a brand new series today called Hearing from Heaven. And my prayer is that, like I say this all the time, uh, but I didn't really think of it as a series until recently. Um, I always say, I pray that you showed up this morning, hope, not wanting to hear from a man, but rather to hear from heaven. And my prayer is that that would, uh, we, we would wrestle this thought and what does this look like? What does it mean to hear from God? What does it mean like to hear from the Holy Spirit? Because I don't know about you, but like, I want to hear from God. I need to hear from God. Like I need direction on many different things in my life. And so hopefully over the next four weeks when we dive into the series, that you'll get some more clarity on what this actually means to hear from heaven. And so uh, let's jump into it. John chapter 10, I'm gonna read verses one through 14. I'm reading out of the NLT, the New Living Translation this morning. Uh, these are the words of Jesus. And so if you have your Bible open, they should be in red. And so this is what Jesus says. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they followed him because they know his voice. Verse five, they won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Watch this. This is so funny. Verse six, those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. Did anyone understand what I just said? You're like, huh? Sheep, gate, wait, what? All right, here we go. So the Bible's like, yeah, they didn't understand Jesus either. So watch this, verse seven. So he explained it to them. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. Verse 10, one of the most famous scriptures in all of the Bible. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. But Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Verse nine, one more time, and then I'll give you a title. Uh, Jesus says, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and I will find and will find good pastures. I wanna to preach today from this title, if you're taking notes, good pastures, good pastures. Let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you for, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, I pray for just a fresh anointing in this service, God. I don't know everyone in here, but God, you do. So God, would you just customize this word to, Everyone sitting in here today, God, would you speak something clearly to them that truly would change their life, that they would leave better than they came. They would leave full of faith, full of passion, full of vision for the life that you've called them to live. And so God, thank you for what you're doing in this house. We give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen, amen and amen. Well, listen, if I've never met you or if I've never got a chance to shake your hand, I would, I would, uh, it would be my honor to meet you. Uh, if you. If you're new to church or if you're new to God's house, uh, really, I try to stand up here every single week and share the word of God in a relatable way so that way you can have practical handles to live life God's way, right? That's like kind of, I feel like where God's graced me to preach in that way. And I always tell all of my friends, if you hang out with me long enough, I will probably end up preaching about you because I, I wanna see God in every area of my life. And so if we go to dinner or hang out or go work out, I'm probably gonna use your life as an example or some illustration, right? And so my kids and my wife know this better than anyone. Um, if, you've, if you don't know, I have four kids, so pray for your pastor. Um, 10, eight, four, and two. Uh, three boys and one girl. 
and I often will use their life as uh, illustrations to bring God's word. So when they're older, they're going to look back over all these videos and be like, I'm going to be like, yeah, you see how bad you were for dad? Um, I let everyone know about your life. Um, so if you ever come to my house, maybe during the week, because you know how sometimes you invite guests over and you'll clean up the house, like you'll make sure everything's nice and neat, but then you got that one room that's just like all clutter. Um, well, my house, 90% of the time is that one room, or just all clutter. Just all, everything, it's just wild because we got four kids. And um, my house is not the place where you show up to where you want like peace. Like if you wanna, you know, you want some quiet time, it, my house is probably not the place to go. Like you walk through the door and you'll hear screaming and you'll hear um, uh, nails coming down a chalkboard and you'll hear um, fighting and you'll hear wrestling. It's just not the place you go to for peace. And oftentimes when the house gets a little chaos, come on, you know, your anxiety levels start to rise a little bit. And so me and Mariah will we'll, we'll tell the kids, you guys need to go outside because we're about to catch a case if you don't. You know what I'm saying? Like go outside and they got really two options. They could play in the grass or they can play on the trampoline. So we're like, go do something, just get out of the house. And so we sent all four of our kids outside and it never works out for our benefit because they always come back in crying or hurting or bleeding or something happened, um, especially when they get on the trampoline. Because when you got a 10 year old and a two year old on a trampoline, you know bad things are about to happen. So all three big brothers are trying to launch their little sister over the net and the net's broke. And it's just like one thing after the other. And we know better as parents, but yet we do it anyways because we want that three minutes of just silence in the house. Come on, parents, you know what I'm talking about. And so the, a couple months ago, my oldest son, he comes in the house and he's like, he's the alpha. He's the one that, he's the instigator. He's the troublemaker. He, he's the one that always wants to be in charge and kind of lead his little brothers and sister. And he comes in the house and he does not cry um, publicly, but he will sure hold those tears of like, dude, just let him go, man. Come on, Elsa, just let it go. And um, I told you, there's a lot of kid references. Um, and so he comes in the house and he's holding his nose and he's like about to cry. And I'm like, dude, what happened? He's like, brave. I'm like, brave what? He's like, brave. And so brave comes in and brave's crying. I'm like, what happened, boys? And then Brave's like, well, he was holding me down. My, Brave's my four-year-old. He was holding me down and he wouldn't let me go and he had my arms tied. And I'm like, well, why are you holding your nose? Like, what, he, what did you do to him? In Bronx, my 10-year-old, he's like, he headbutted me. And I'm like, he headbutted you? And in my dad heart, I'm like, that's my boy. Because <laughs> like, I, I never taught him a headbutt. Like, where did he learn that move from? Like, low key, I'm extremely proud of him. He headbutted his older brother. And I'm like, well, why didn't you punch him? You know, that would be like a, a response, like a, a good jab, you know? Why didn't you tackle him? Or here's a better idea. Why didn't you come inside and tell mom and dad? Like we tell you, if your brothers are picking on you, come tell us and we'll deal with it. But instead you chose to headbutt him. And so I go, Brave, why did you headbutt your brother? He goes, I heard a voice. <laughs> what do you mean you heard a voice? Yeah, I heard a voice in my head. God said I can headbutt him. I'm like, hold on, son. Wait, say that in. God said I can headbutt him. And I'm going to go, son, God did not say you can headbutt your brother. Yes, he did. Son, I need to teach you how God speaks because God did not tell you that you can headbutt your brother. That was your will and your desire wanting to break your brother's nose. No, dad, God said I can headbutt my brother brother. How many of you know God said those two words are powerful? Those two words are abused. Those two words can bring life and those two words can bring harm. One thing that we must settle with today is that we live in a fallen human nature. And then just because someone says God said does not, does not mean God said. Just like my boy who thought God said, many people use and abuse the two words God said and God really never said. There has been movements and many different things that have happened because people claim God said. How I many you know the American slavery movement is because men said, God said we can do this. German Nazis, the, they said, God said we can wipe out everyone who doesn't look like us. How many of you know just because Someone says God said doesn't mean God's in it. Just because God's name is on something doesn't mean God's spirit is in something. 
God said. Two most powerful words and the two most abused words. And so the question this morning that I pose to you is, okay, well, how do we decipher what God actually said? How do I refute to my four-year-old that God didn't actually say that? How do we know what God said? When I hear God's voice, is it my voice? Is it God's voice? Is it the devil's voice? Is it the pastor's voice? Is it my counselor's voice? Is it the podcast I listen to? Whose voice is it? How do we know what God actually said? I will say to you this morning, sometimes it's, it can feel overwhelming. I don't know about you, but for me sometimes, trying to hear the voice of God. Because we're bombarded with so many other voices. And the crazy thing about the world we live in, all those other voices scream so loud. But yet we serve a God who only whispers. And so when you have all these other voices who are extremely loud and extremely clear and extremely abundant on their opinion and their thought, you have everything coming at you. How are you supposed to then hear the voice of God? There are people right now that have been coming to this church all day and sitting in this service right now who are faced with real life decisions. Do I buy? Do I sell? Do I start the job and quit this one and go to that one? Do we try again for another baby? Do we adopt? Do we, real, whatever your circumstance is, there's real life situations, real things that you must decide in the next week or two. And you're trying to hear from heaven. You're trying to hear God's opinion on it. You're trying to hear God's voice on it, but it seems like he's nowhere to be found. You ever been there before? But apparently, John 10, the words of Jesus, he says, my sheep will know my voice. That's a promise from God. That's a word from God. They're in red letters. Jesus said that. So why would Jesus say something that sometimes feels impossible? And my heart with this series is to help you hear God's voice and really understand what that means. Hear me loud and clear. My, my goal every week as your pastor is not to get you familiar with my voice. My goal is to get you familiar with God's voice. As your pastor, if you ever feel like I'm trying to put my voice above God's voice, run. Leave this place. My job every single Sunday is not to get you familiar with how I talk and my rhetoric and my language and my jokes and my everything. No, my job is to help equip you and lead you and guide you to understand what God's voice sounds like. Because here's the truth. You may leave this church. You may leave this city. You may move to Tennessee. You may move down the hill. You may transfer a job and for whatever reason you can't make it here. And guess who's not going to be with you in all those places? Your boy. I ain't going with you. But guess who will be there with you? God will be there. And so you must learn the voice of God rather than putting all your trust in a man. You must understand, what does God sound like? What does his voice in my life look like? And now I get it now. Biblically, there, I do have a, a, a certain role in your life as your pastor, as the lead shepherd of this house. There, there is a unique position that I have that I can speak into your life and and open up the word of God with you and help decipher that with you. There is that, I get all that, but don't ever let me have a throne in your life. Hear me loud and clear. I love this quote by Dallas Willard. Uh, He says this, it is so challenging like Sadducees of old that many church leaders discourage the idea that God would speak to the individual. And some leaders obviously prefer that God speaks only to them and not to the flock. See, I am not your priest, Jesus is. I am not your middleman, Jesus is. I am not your your mediator between you and God. Jesus is. My job is to equip you, train you, and help lead you to learn his voice. And so how do we hear the voice of God? Great question. There's very, very practical ways that we can know the voice of God. I want to give you eight of them this morning that will all make sense logically to you. So number one, we, we hear God's voice through God's word. That's the most obvious one, right? We got the Bible. We got the word of God that we open up the word. And that is what God has already spoken to us. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. The word of God is God's voice. The second way we hear his voice is through prayer. Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you, God says. 
We hear God's voice through the, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said. We hear God's voice through worship and song like we just sang. We hear God's voice through nature. You walk outside. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And so nature will even speak God's voice. We hear God's voice through life circumstances. Come on, how many of you have ever been through something and you could look back and go, man, God was speaking to me all through that circumstance. God will speak to us. We see in the book of Daniel, we see in Joseph's life that God will speak through dreams and through visions. You ever woke up and like, man, I don't know, that dream just seemed like it was from God. You ever been there before? God will also speak to you through people, through pastors, through your neighbor, through your coworker, men especially. God will speak to you through your wife. Come on, I don't know what it is about women, but they got, they got the ears to hear. So just listen when they say what God is saying. But ladies, on the same hand, your man, come on, he's a man of God. Come on, look at your, your husband if you're here with him today and just look in his eyes, just real seductively, just tell him, man of God. If you're not married, that's not for you. But like God can use people to bring his word. And so how do we improve our communication with God? Because wouldn't that be the goal? We, we know all these things. Man, he can speak through his word. He can speak through prayer. He can speak through people. We know that. But how do we improve our communication with him? How do I hear more loudly, more clearly? I want to help us with that this morning. I just want to give you four thoughts on what that looks like on how to improve our communication with God. Number one, here's the first thing that you need to do. Write this down. Believe he speaks. If you want to hear from God, number one, the first thing that you must do is believe that he actually speaks. John 10, Jesus says, the sheep will know my voice. And so again, why would Jesus promise something if it seems impossible to do? If you go all the way back and read Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two, you'll, you'll learn three things about God. Number one, you'll learn that God is powerful. Number two, you'll learn that God is creative. And lastly, you'll learn that God speaks. There was all kinds of scriptures in the Bible that says God said, and there was. God said, and there was. God said, and there was water. God said, and there was light. God said, and there was land. God said. 2,500 times all throughout the Bible, the term God said is used. So apparently God wants you to know he's a speaking God. So first and foremost, we must start with the idea that if you want to hear from God, number one, you must believe that he speaks. Hebrews 11, chapter, six, uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 6 says this, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Why? Because anyone who comes to him must first believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And so first and foremost, man, you got to believe that he exists. You got to come to God in faith. And I wonder for many of us if we've stopped hearing from God simply because we stopped believing that he's speaking. And I would challenge that thought and say, maybe it isn't that God has stopped speaking. Maybe, just maybe, it's you've stopped listening. I don't, I don't hear from God. Well, do you believe that he speaks? Do you believe that he can talk to you? Do you believe that he wants to talk to you? Do you believe that you can hear him? Or... Has the other voices in your life become so loud that God's voice is turned down so low and you've just simply stopped listening? Because here's the reality. Sometimes we can open up the word of God or come to church and hear all these stories. And then you look at the Bible and you're like, man, God spoke to Elijah. God spoke to Elisha. God spoke to Abraham. God spoke to Moses. God spoke to uh, uh, all, just all the Peter and just all these people, right? All the, like God spoke to all these people. And then we go, well, of course God will talk to them. They're Bible characters. Yeah, but they're also humans. So if God can speak to them, come on, somebody, he can speak to me. If God can speak to Elijah, he can speak to me. If God can speak to Moses, he can speak to you. If God could anoint David, he can anoint you. Like, he, he wants to speak to you. And so you must believe this. Because the, the minute you tell someone that God spoke to you, immediately, we, like, red flags go up. Right? It's like, hey, man, God, God said this. It's like, oh, red flag weirdo coming, <laughs> right? Because we speak to God, we call it prayer. God speaks to us, we call it crazy. You know what I mean? Like if you just walk around and go, hey buddy, I just need to let you know something like God said this, uh, told me to tell you, you're immediately like, come on kids. 
But the truth is we serve a speaking God. We serve a God that wants to dialogue with us. See, prayer is not a monologue. It's not a one-way conversation. Prayer is a back and forth conversation. It's a, it's a dialogue. God wants to speak to every single one of you. Like God is not up in heaven right now playing a sick game of hide and seek with you. You know what I mean? Like he is not hiding behind the clouds going, hey guys, you think they're going to see me over here? God is not hiding in the corner of heaven behind a, a drape hoping you don't find him. Like my sons, I, I play hide and go seek with them, especially like my four-year-old. And when I go hide, guess what? I don't hide in the hardest place ever to find me unless I want that piece I was talking about. But like when I hide, I hide in obvious places. Like I hide, I'm like on my couch, like sideways. You know, I'm like sitting on the stairs. I want them to find me because I'm a good father. How much better is our father in heaven? He's not hiding he's from you. He wants to speak to you. So here's the second thing. Write this down. If we want to improve our communication with God, then we must choose to listen if he actually does speak. Look at verse three. It says this. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. I wonder, for many of us, the reason that we don't hear from God is simply because we don't want to. Because we know deep down inside that if God actually speaks to us, then we're probably not going to do the thing that God is asking us to do. Because most of the time, what I've learned, maybe you're better than me, is that whatever God speaks to me typically goes against my flesh and my desires. And so subconsciously, I've turned down his voice because I know that I don't want to do what he's asked me to do anyways. So therefore, I don't hear from him. Or you just think God's silence is approval to do the thing that you want to do anyways. This is good. See, m most Christians want to be his sheep but they want to be their own shepherd. They don't want him as their shepherd. Like we love the idea of being sheep. Like we will like print it on a sweatshirt, like the Lord is my shepherd. I'm just a little soft sheep. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down. And like, we like the idea of it, but like actually making him our shepherd and following his voice is a whole nother thing. Especially as Americans, like we're, we're men, like I'm not a sheep, brother. <laughs> well, according to God, you're a sheep. If you're a Christian, if you, if you identify as a Christian, then you're a sheep. And what I've learned throughout my study is that sheep are kind of dumb. And that's what you and I are likened to in our relationship with God. Like God looks at you and I and he's like, my little dumb sheep, let me lead you. And we're like, bah, thank you, Lord. Like if there was a group of sheep walking along the ledge of a cliff and one of them fell in, guess what? All the others would voluntarily jump in. True, that's how dumb they are. Like they'll just wander around, lost. If a sheep falls over, this is how, this is how little strength they have. They can't even get back up. They will lay there if they don't have help and die. Like, they are dumb. They're not very smart. But again, that's who you and I are likened to with our relationship with God. Without a shepherd, they have no food. Without a shepherd, they have no shelter. Without a shepherd, they have no vision. Without a shepherd, they have no good fields to go to. Without a shepherd, they, they, they can't find other good sheep to hang with. Without, without a shepherd, they just wander lost, and eventually they end up dying because they have no shepherd. And it's the same for you and I. Without a shepherd, we have no vision. Without a shepherd, we end up lost. Without a shepherd, we end up hurting ourselves, lost, wondering, going, bah, I'm lost. <laughs> when there is a shepherd going, come here, you dumb little sheep, there's good pasture this way. But we want to shepherd ourselves. And so you must wrestle with this question on your own. Will I actually choose to listen if he speaks to me in the first place? Because what I've learned, again, is that God will have you stop doing some things and start doing some things that goes against what your mind and your flesh desire. So if he speaks to you and says, stop eating those things, will you do it? But you're like, Pastor Brad, I really love these cookies. 
Or if he says, start eating this way, or stop this job, or start, or whatever it is, will you actually do it if he says it? Because all of us would agree, man, if I could hear the audible word of God, then I would do it for sure. Like, yes, for sure. Will you? Judas walked with him, still denied him. The Pharisees seen miracles. Many people seen miracles, signs, and wonders. They've seen dead people get raised to new life. They've seen blind eyes open up, and they still doubted. But not me, Pastor Brown. If I've really seen that, then I would believe it. Okay, sheep. Okay, dummy. Not, not you guys, people watching online. So you have to choose, are you going to follow? Okay, I believe he can speak, but am I actually going to follow? And here's, here's the amazing thing about God is he doesn't force you to follow him. Like he'll speak something to you and then give you the option to follow him or not. He doesn't force you into the gate. That's, that's the amazing thing. Here's a third way that we can improve our communication with God is that you got to get to know him. Like you got to get to know his voice. And that takes time. Look at verse four. It says, after uh, he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. Verse five, they won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. They don't know a stranger's voice. See, the other week we were in Walmart in another city and uh, we were doing some, some shopping. And um, you know, like when you have your hometown, like we, we're usually target people because it's convenient. So when you go to Walmart, you need an extra blessing, number one. But then when you're in another city, it's even like, God, I need your hedge of protection over my life. And then like, you know how you have your stores and like your stores feel like good. But then you go to another Target, another Walmart, you're like, yeah, this is not right. Like my aisle should be right here. Like Starbucks should be right here. The check you know what I'm talking about, right, ladies? Come on, you know. It just doesn't feel right when you go to other places. And so me and the family were walking through Walmart and it's springtime. So we were looking at like life jackets and all the, all the, water stuff. And um, we looked up and us, all the boys, we were lost. And we're like, uh-oh, like, where's Mariah? What do we do here? I'm not used to shopping. Like, where, where do I go? Like, what do I do with my hands? You know? And I was like, all right, boys, follow me. Like, we got to find mom. And there's people everywhere. And they're like, we're not familiar with this place. And I'm scared. <laughs> the boys are sensing my fear. And, I, and I'm like, all right, you know what I should do? I should just scream. I should just yell out because Mariah knows my voice. And I go, honey. And I swear to you, she goes, we're over here. <laughs> and it was like seven aisles away. And sure enough, like she was right there because she knows my voice. See, if any of you other brothers would have said, honey, she wouldn't have listened. But because we've spent time together, because she's heard my voice, she knows my tonality, she knows the way I speak, she knows the way I yell, honey, because I do it all the time in the house, she knows my voice because she's experienced it. It's the same thing with God. you got to experience the voice of God because it has a sound to it. It has a tone to it. It has a heart to it. It has a, that's God. Oh, that's my, oh, yeah, that's Brand. I know his voice. Even though it might be annoying to her, she knows my voice. See, this, this is not parenting advice, um, but what we do with my kids is we try to manipulate them a lot of times and um, into good things, right? But it's the truth. Come on, you know you've tried to trick your, you know, use Santa Claus as like a, a threat to your kids. Come on, you know you've done that before. Like, I will tell Santa. I will tell God. Come on, you, we've all done this, right? Uh, for us, uh, there was a, a couple years back, my boys were, were like obsessed with Cristiano Ronaldo and... Uh, another soccer player named Christian Pulisic. They're like the, their favorite two players. And so we would threaten them with these guys. We're like, I will call Ronaldo right now. And I will tell him what, how you're acting. I will call Christian Pulisic right now and I will tell him what you're doing. And they would be like, no, like, please don't. And so we use this, right? And so I picked up the phone. Mariah goes outside and uh, she picks up. She's like, hello. And I'm like, Ronaldo. He's like, Yeah. I'm like, hey, listen, you got to talk to Blaze right now. You got to talk to Bronx right now. Like, they're not listening. And so she's like, boys, you, if you want to make it where I'm at, like, you got to listen to your mom and dad. And my boys, no joke, they'd be like, yes, sir. Like, we'll do it, you know. And it's so funny. We had to tell them like a couple years later, like, that was mom, you know. 
but they were so easily fooled into thinking that that was their real voice because they're not familiar with how their real voice sounds. And see, that's how a lot of maybe new believers or people who don't know the voice of God yet, you're tricked into thinking that hello is God. (laughs) But you must learn what the voice of God sounds like because there is a lot of people who will say, God said, and it's hello. (laughs) It ain't God at all. It don't even sound like him. Matter of fact, Ronaldo doesn't even speak English. (laughs) But they're so immature, right? They're just kids. They don't know yet. They're not mature enough to know what God's voice sounds like. And see, many of us, if you've been around long enough, if you desire to know his voice, then you must mature. You must seek his voice. You must open his word. You must spend time in prayer. You must want to hear it, choose to listen, and get to know him. But if you just come in every week and go, yeah, I'll just listen what the pastor says, well, then you're just learning my voice and not God's voice. God's desire that you will learn his voice so you don't get tricked into thinking God said, when really God is nowhere in that. Is this making sense to you? Is this helping anybody? All right. Where am I at? What point am I on? You guys are fun. You guys are good. Point three. Um, let's see. L- let me just give you some advice, because maybe, uh, maybe you're new to church. Maybe you're new to faith. Maybe you're new to this whole like Jesus thing, faith thing. Here's, here would be my encouragement to you just keep showing up. Like, just be consistent in your prayer time, in your Bible time, in your church. Like, just be consistent, and you'll learn the voice of God. But it doesn't happen in one Sunday. It doesn't happen in one two-minute prayer before you have a big decision to make at work. It doesn't happen in one Bible study. It doesn't happen. It happens over a long period of time. Little right decisions done over a long period of time leads you to the the voice of God, leads you to doing the right things. So just be consistent. Um, all right, pastor, I believe he speaks. I want to hear, I choose to follow him. I've been saved for a long time. I, I feel like I'm mature in my faith. But I, I, I check all the boxes, but I still don't hear from him. Anyone identify? I still don't hear from him. W- w- what does this look like? Well, maybe, just maybe, this is just a theory, but maybe he's silent uh, because you don't need a new word from him. Maybe he's silent because you just need to obey the last thing that he told you to do. Like, maybe he's not speaking to you about a new thing because he's still waiting for you to obey the last thing he told you to do. (laughs) Like, he's probably silent because he's, like, waiting on you. Like, yeah, I would give you new revelation. I would give you new direction. I would give you a new thing, but you yet still to obey the last thing that I've told you to do. And so if you've yet to obey that, why would I give you something new? See, some people are, and I, I hope I offend you right now in the best way possible, to grow your relationship closer to Christ. Some of you are praying for things right now that God has already given you an answer to. You just don't like the answer. You just don't like what he's said, and so you take his silence as an approval for the thing that you actually wanna do. And God's like, I didn't say to do that. I've already made it abundantly clear in my word. Well, God, you know what? Um, we've been dating you know, for, for two years now, and God, I just really since he's the one in God. I just, I know what your will is that we would be together. So God, we're just praying. Should we move in together right now? God, like, you know, silence. God's like, you dummy, I've already laid that out. I've already been clear about that. You don't need direction. God, you know what? I'm just, should we be generous, God? I just don't know if we should be generous. God's like, silence. I'm not going to answer something I've already answered. See, I would, I would give you this illustration. My boys, I, Many times, again, I talk about them, um, they get their iPads taken away for many different reasons. But what I'll do is I'll go, boys, your iPad's gone. Two weeks, you'll get it back on Friday. Okay, Dad. The next day, they come to me, Dad, can we have our iPads back? (laughs) And it's oftentimes when I'm busy working or doing something, they'll come knock, Dad, can we have our iPads back? And I look at them, and I go right back to work. (laughs) Dad, Dad. Can we get our iPads back? Dad! Do you want to get in trouble right now? Dad, well, can we get our iPads back? See, because they don't need a new word. I've already given them my answer. They need obedience. And if they obey the things I'm telling them to do, then maybe with obedience and good behavior, I'll give them their iPads back. But they just simply don't want to obey the answer that I've already given them. And that's many of us today. God's like, bruh. I've already answered this. 
You don't need a new revelation or a new word. You need new obedience. So some of you today just need to pray to obey. Come on, that'll preach. Hey, you need to pray to obey what God is speaking to you. God's silence is not approval for the thing that you just want to do on your own. So how do I hear from God? Okay, good question. Believe he speaks, want to hear from him, learn it by experience. And then when I was studying this week, when I read chapter verse nine, I felt like the Holy Spirit just smacked me across the face. Because this is, I believe, how our relationship should be with God. We should seek his voice, desire his voice, learn it by experience, all those things. But lastly, when you do all that, here's, a, here's my last point. You find freedom in his voice. Here's what I mean. Look at verse nine. This is, again, the words of Jesus. Worship team, you come join me. He says, I am the gate. Okay, we got it. Jesus, watch this. Jesus says, I am the gate. Who's the gate? Jesus is the gate, okay? Those who come in through me, will be saved, okay? That makes sense, right? Jesus is the gate. Those who come in through him will be saved. Salvation, great. Only way to the Father, through Jesus, we get it. He's the gate, come to him, we'll be saved, amen. That makes sense. Now, watch this. They, who's they? Us, right? Bad, the sheep. <laughs> they will come, come where? To Jesus, right? They will come and go freely, right? And we'll find good pasture. Hold on, wait, let's read that again because I just to make sure I'm clear. They are, that's us, the sheep. They'll come and go where? To the gate, which is Jesus. They'll come and go freely and they will find good pasture. When I read this, it messed me up because what God is saying is my desire for you is that you would become a mature believer, a disciple, right? His desire for us is that we would, we would grow in our understanding of who he is. We would grow in our understanding of who we're supposed to be in him. We would not compromise on our values and morals. We would give him glory in all circumstances, no matter what life looks like. We would understand biblical authority. We would be someone who is sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. All these things of what you would think in your mind a mature believer looks like. God's desire is you would grow into that person, right? And God says, if you can get to that place, then you can come and go freely. Wait, hold on. God, you mean to tell me that our will matters too? That our desires matter too? that our wants matter to you, God? See, God has set a boundary for us to live within, okay? God says within my boundary, come and go, there's freedom. So God, you know, God, I just, I don't know if I should take the job or not take the job. God, it's just a really hard decision. I don't know what to do. God, I don't know if we should sell right now or buy right now. God, I don't know if I should if we should try again or adopt. God, I don't know what to do. Well, are both options within my boundary? If you take the job or don't take the job, will you be a man of God at both places? Will you be a, a, someone who represents me in both places? Will you be someone who, no matter what life looks like, will still give me glory in both places? Yes, God, for sure. Well, then come and go freely, you pick. You catching this? Well, God, I need direction. Well, what if prayer time wasn't about getting a direction from God? What if your prayer time was more about you having communion with God? What if God is not giving you a clear answer to the thing that you're needing direction for because God is not interested in telling you left or right, A or B? What if God is more interested in you becoming the person he's called you to be so therefore you can make your own decision? Because either way, you're going to give him glory. Either way, you're coming through the gate. Either way, you're a man of integrity. You're not going to compromise about who you are. You're not, well, God, if I move to Tennessee, then I'll lose my faith. If I stay in California, then I'll keep my faith. Well, God's like, well, that's clear. Stay. But if you're going to be the same in both places, God says, choose. 
Put it up one more time because I don't think you're getting it. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Thank you, Lord. They, us, the sheep, will come to Jesus and they'll go freely. You got movement. Your will, your desire, those matter to God. But not only that, you'll find good pastures. So God's saying like, I'm with you wherever you go. I'm with you whatever decision you make because I am the good shepherd and I will lead you to good pastures. Is this helping anybody? Is this like maybe challenging some of you theologically right now? Because you're looking at me like some Pharisees. But when I read this, I was like, there is freedom in that. But here's the catch. This is the goal. The goal is to be mature. The goal is to be wise. The goal is to understand his voice. The goal is to know the word. The goal is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And then when you're all those things, when you're actively seeking him and his voice and getting good counsel and you're, you're doing all the right things and you're becoming the person God's called you to become, then he says, come and go freely. But if you're new, if you're like new to all this and you don't know wisdom from wise from unwise, you don't know good from bad, you don't know like, hello, oh, like you don't know that's not, like if you don't know those things yet, keep this goal in mind. But until then, come on, be surrounded by community. Until then, come on, come into the house of God and, and let other people speak wisdom into you. But the goal is, and I'm mature. I, I, I know me. I got good character. I got, I, I'm, I'm a man of God. I, I'm a I'm faithful husband. Like, I'm going to give God glory no matter what my life looks like. I've proven that. God, I don't know what to, what, what to do. God's like, you choose. You choose. And there is freedom in the voice of God when you could get to that place. See, here's, maybe this will be more clear to you. God spoke to Moses one time in a burning bush. There wasn't burning bushes every time Moses walked and God kept speaking to him. No, he, he gave him direction one time. And then Moses acted upon the word he gave him. And then he was making decisions, he was doing things, he was freeing the people. God spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden one time. He said, all this is yours. Be fruitful, be multiply, have authority, have dominion. All of it's yours. There's just one tree, the boundary. Don't touch that one. See, God's given us a boundary. He's given us a playlist, right? He's given us, hey, it's all good within the boundary. Be free. See, Adam and Eve didn't go to God and go, God, can we eat from this tree? God, where should we lay our heads? God, where should we build our house? God, where should we? No, no, no. He was like, it's all yours. Move around. Make a decision. Just stay within my boundary. God spoke to the apostle Paul, Saul at the time, one time. Remember he blinded him on the road to Damascus? He blinded his eyes. He says, why are you persecuting me? Gave him a vision of who he could be, one time. And then after that, the apostle Paul grew into the man that God created him to be. And then he went on to be an apostle, right? Half the New Testament. But Jesus only spoke to him one time. And so maybe the reason that you leave your prayer time and sometimes you feel like a, almost like a shame because you're like, man, I didn't, I didn't hear from God. Like what's, what's wrong with me? Like, why can I get clear direction? And everyone else seems to have, you know, direction. Maybe you have the wrong goal of your prayer time. Maybe the goal of prayer time is not to get direction from God, but maybe God is saying the goal of prayer time is to have communion with me. Because in all those times seeking his voice and all those times opening up his word and all those times seeking counsel, what you're actually doing is learning the voice of God. What you're actually doing is maturing. And so maybe you don't get clear direction, but God's like, you choose. Because I know either way, you're gonna follow me. I hope this frees some of you today because I've been wrestling with this all week and trying to articulate it in a way that's clear, that will help you. Because the truth is there is big, important decisions that you must make. Is there anyone in here, raise your hand, let me just see you, that has an important decision that you must make? Like, what do I do with my life? 
Yeah, there you, you choose. You choose. Come and go freely within his boundary. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this word. God, thank you for the Holy Spirit who does lead us and guide us, protects us, comforts us, and convicts us, reminds us of your words, like in John 10, that you are the good shepherd. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but God, you come to give us life and life more abundantly. And so God, when we're out wandering in, in pastures that don't seem good, God, will we hear your still small voice calling us back to your good pastures, green pastures, pastures with life and life abundantly, the Zoe life. God, thank you for your word. God, we want to glorify you and honor you in every way possible. And so we admit that we're sheep, we're sinners, we're lost without you, God. If that's you in here today and you've never given your life to Christ, I just want to offer you that opportunity just between you and God. You don't need to come to me, then to God. Just between you and God right there in this moment, just out of your own mouth, under your own breath, a simple confession of faith. God, I believe in you. God, I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. That three days later, the same spirit that rose him from the grave is now living on the inside of me. God, I believe it, that he paid for all my sins. So God, I confess my sins to you. I thank you for forgiving me of all of my sins. And God, make me new. Come on, this is your prayer to God. Make me new. Use me, God. Use my life. I've, I've come to the end of myself. Now I need a good shepherd. I need a Lord. I need a savior. I need a master. I need a controller. Have my life, God. If that's you in here today, just simply lift up your hand. I want to just acknowledge you. No one's looking around. Head bowed, eye closed. If that's you in here today, I see you right here. I see you in the back. I see you right here in the middle. Hands going up all over the place. I see you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, just between you and God right now. God, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe in you. I make you my Lord. I make you my Savior. Thank you, Lord. If you're a Christian in here today and you've walked away, you've been like that dumb sheep jumping off cliffs. Lord, remind us of who you are. God, we want to get back on track. That's our goal. That's our heart. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. And we say all this together in the name that's above every other name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hey,